to invite you to turn in your word at Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 24 to 27, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. I won't be long today, but I need your attention for the word. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. The Bible says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I would liken him to a wise man who built his house on what? Hmm? And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on what? On sand. The rain descended and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. Great was its fall. For the next little while we'll speak on the topic. A solid foundation. A solid foundation. Let's pray together. Father, for the next few moments, oh God, I pray in a special way that you will speak words to your people that you will use this person standing before your people today, O oh God, and, and like, like you've done before, that you will speak in a copious manner. Lord, allow for each and every one of us who hears the words today, those online and those who are present, Lord, we ask that we will not turn a deaf ear to these words, but we will hear, we will listen, and we will do all that you have said and that our foundation will be secure in you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. A solid foundation. In the year 1174, an Italian architect by the name of Bonanno Pisano began what would be his most famous project. It was a bell tower to beautify the cathedral of the city. The tower was to be cylindrical, eight stories, 185 foot tall building with arcaded stories. It was to be a fine example of Tuscan Romanesque architecture. There was just one little problem about this building. During the construction, the builders discovered that the soil around the cathedral was much softer than they had anticipated. And the foundation that Pisano had designed for the building was just too shallow for its construction. Before long, the whole building began to tilt, and they were worried that it would fall. The architect and the builders all got together and decided that they were going to make something to shore up the leaning tower of Pisa. The problem is, that it would take 176 years in all to complete construction on the tower. And throughout that time, the builders tried many different ways to compensate for the tilt of this building. The foundations were shored up and reinforced. The upper levels of the tower were built at an angle to try and at least make the top that was now tilting look straight. But nothing worked. In fact, in fact, the Tower of Pisa continues to stand for more than 800 years now, but it now leans more than 18 feet away from the center position. And even with all of our modern technology and now new architectural uh, individuals coming out of school with their, their computers, they can't fix the problem because there was a danger in the foundation. My question to each and every one who's under the sound of my voice today is where are you building this morning? In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus brings to light this entire process of building to each and every one of us this morning. In fact, in fact, Jesus is expounding upon the word to a crowd of people in Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea, and the Decapolis, or the ten cities that are in the area. 
Jerusalem, in fact, in fact, was not too far away, and thousands of people were gathering to be able to hear Jesus in this message. Young and old, rich and poor, all gathered together on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And this has been an eventful day for Jesus. He had been preaching for a long time. And this begins, of course, the famous Sermon on the Mount. You all know it. It is here on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus begins by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then, of course, he highlights those who are mourning. Anyone mourning today? Those who are mourning, God says, you shall be comforted. He gives us a word of encouragement throughout this first message that he's preaching. He lets us know when he ends. He says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. You shall, and shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake. He says, blessed to them. Jesus ends the sermon by giving this parable about two men. How many men? Two men. In it, we find that these two men, he's classified as wise and foolish. One is wise and one is foolish. The wise man, Jesus said, drafted up a plan and built his house on or upon or by the rock. He's a smart man, knowing that, that the only one thing that you can do when you're building is to ensure that you build on a solid foundation. And if you've been doing your own thing, and trying your own way for a long time, chances are that you have not built on a solid foundation. The Bible also presents another man. The other man is said to be unwise or foolish. This foolish man, we find, has gone about. He seems to be intelligent because he gets a plan drafted up. In fact, in fact, what is unique about this is that the two men use the same plans. They use the same plans. But the unwise man or the foolish man spent his time digging for a long time. Why is he digging for a long time? Because it's all sand. He's digging and digging and digging and can't find anything solid to dig on. To dig to, I should say. But instead, he decides that he's going to DIY. DIY, do it yourself. We don't hear about others helping this man. When you read through the narrative, there is no one else coming by to, to dig with him. He plans everything out. He has the architectural drawings. He goes about and he takes his shovel and he begins to dig into the sand to, be in, to begin to build his house. And as he's building, we all understand that the whole building process, Brother Cummings, is important. Why is it important? Because if you're going to build, you need first plans, right? Then you need to be able to, to, to build your foundation. So you need to dig a, 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 a place around. And then what do you get? Anyone know? What do you get when you're building? You got to respond to me now. I don't want you to sleep on me. What do you get? You, you get what? Come on, you can talk to me now. Many of you live in a house, right? You live in an apartment. You want to be sure that that foundation is solid. You want to be sure that where you're going to be sleeping at night is safe and secure. So when you're building a, a, a house, let's say you, you want to go and you buy yourself a plot of land, one of the first things that you do, you go and you get a plan. You get an architect to design the plan. Am I right or wrong? You get an architect to design your plan, and when you have your plans, you go and you verify it with your city, especially in Miami. You can't build anything here without a permit. I know, trust me. So you get your permit, you go back with your piece of land, and you find now an excavator or someone, you can hire a company to dig. I'm, going, I'm getting into it now. You find and you dig an entire, entire piece, scaling out all the dimensions that the architect has drawn. Then you go ahead and you get yourself some rebar. Steel. You need steel, right? If you're building, especially in Miami. Why? Because you don't want the storms to come by and take your house down. So all of a sudden, this man digs just like we would. 
He, he, he sets his, his, his rebar or whatever else he had to ensure that even on sand that he has something to build on. After he, he goes and he gets a cement truck, the cement truck comes in and the cement truck begins to pour the cement all over the place. And this man lays it all out. He sees it, then he goes ahead and he gets his brick. Am I right or wrong? He gets his brick and he lays out his brick and he puts it down brick after brick. And for some of us, we would be even stronger if you put a rebar inside of the brick. Then you pour the cement on top of that that strengthens the house. He could have done everything possible just like the other guy who is building on the rock. He goes about and he digs into the sand. The problem is that he is digging in sand. That's the problem. It's not the plans it's not the fact that he didn't have rebar. It's not the fact that he didn't have concrete. The problem is that he's digging in sand. And I've gone through and I've read this thing like a thousand times trying to understand what is the major difference between the two men. If you're using the same plan and you're using rebar and you're using concrete, then how is it that, that this man is stupid? Okay, okay, let me, let me clean it up for the kids. Why in the world would the Bible say that this man is foolish and the other man is wise if they're using the same plan, if they're using the same architect, if they're using the same builder, or they are the builder? So he's a master builder. Understand, understand, by the way, let me come back to this. You realize that, that when it talks about Jesus was a carpenter, that when you go over in that part of the world, you, you realize there's not a lot of trees, right? Okay, let me, let me. There's not a lot of trees in that part of the world. Let me just blow your mind here for a moment. So, so therefore, when it talks about Jesus being, being an, uh, a carpenter, it means that most likely Jesus was a builder. So he was used to building houses. That's why he's pulling from this, this analogy to, to share with individuals. So he's now sharing an entire building process so people understand in that day what was really happening. The good part about it is that Miami is very similar to that part of the world. So we should understand what it's like to build on sand. Because if you dig in your backyard right now, lo and behold, you get one foot down, you will hit sand. I don't want to scare anybody. But I must let you know the main difference between the two is that one is counted as wise and one is counted as foolish. But the one that is unwise is the one that built on sand. And no matter how much you try and reinforce things, it's still going to crumble. All right, that should shake us. Why? Because we have Surfside. And we have a 40-year recertification. And a building like this one, it should let us know that this world is temporary. And so everything that you see down here in Miami, it may look beautiful and it has palm trees, but understand that you can't find security in it. Why? Because it's only temporary. And why, where am I getting, what am I getting to? What am I getting to? Is that, is that the one that is unwise is the one that builds his entire, his entire household on sand, only to realize that he's investing in something that's going to blow away with the wind. And many of us, you don't understand where I'm going yet, many of us right now, if the truth be told, we too are building on sand. There are some individuals, there are some individuals who don't understand that, 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 that even when you're investing in, in, this, in, this, in, this, in this, in this society, in this place that we are living in right now, many of individuals have come here and you make money and they say, man, I'm going to build everything up, but understand that everything that you build with money is going to collapse. Some are working two and three jobs, killing yourself. Some are breaking the Sabbath to make money that's going to blow away. That's building on sand. When the Bible talks about the foolish man, it's like, man, don't they understand that everything that this world has to offer is sand? Everything that you're putting and investing in right now is going to blow away. And I'm sad and I'm shocked to tell you that even the investments that you have, one day people will go by and will look at money on the street and not pick it up. And, and this house that you, you're investing in and trying to build up, this physical building or this apartment that you're trying to pay every single month to keep, one day you will have to leave it and run. I'll get into that in prophecy. Everything. 
that you're building on right now is going to vanish, is going to crumble before you. And you don't seem to understand that what we, what we build on, the Bible is saying, is that we can't trust anything right now. Everything is going to collapse. One day you drive a nice fancy car and the next day it's gone. One day you have a beautiful house and the next day the, the, the lenders are coming and saying, mm-mm. One day you have it, the next day it's gone in the wind. And we can't allow for ourselves to get so preoccupied, so caught up on the things of this life that we lose sight on the thing that's actually important. And I know you want to have the fancy, fancy things in life, the nicer things in life. I get it. You go ahead, pamper yourself, but understand that everything that you're doing right now is only temporary. There are individuals even now who treat their dogs better than people. There are some individuals, all you're investing in is this relationship. Well, I'm getting in your business. And even when God says, look, that man or that woman, if you invest in them, it's sinking sand. And you're still like, God, but I love him. And God is like, you know this relationship is going to the dirt. But still, it's like, no, I've got to build on that. Some are preoccupied with all types of stuff. You're preoccupied in getting that education, which is great. Go ahead and get that education. But understand that education can't save you. And you can invest all that money in listening to some professor who's telling you all this nonsense, but it's not going to equate anything at the end of the day. It won't amount to anything at the end of the day if you don't have this relationship. What relationship am I talking about? If you don't have a relationship with God, people are putting that relationship with God aside and saying, look, I need my investments. And they're there 24 hours trying to see how they can put in more money into this and, sit th and put that and go into this stock and go into this to make more money, to make more money, to make more money. And all of it is sinking sand. Some are neglecting their children. Neglecting your children because you're preoccupied with stuff that's going to vanish. Neglecting your family, your spouse that you said I do to because you're investing in things that's going to blow away. Forgetting your own religion. Forgetting the fact that God is the one who created you just to go after stuff that's going to blow away. It's all sinking sand. Sinking sand. And God gives us two individuals. It's like, man, we have only two individuals in church. Realize, Jesus is speaking to church folk. He says, look, there are only two of you all in here. Those who are wise and those who are foolish, God help us. Those who are preoccupied in building on stuff that's going to blow away. And those who are really serious about the kingdom. And seeing that all the things that you have in this life is going to vanish, but the things of this life should not matter more than relationship. It's more, for those religious folk, it's more than being faithful in tithe and offering. It's more than being early for Sabbath school. Because there are some religious folk who take it so serious that they miss sight on the relationship. All right, man, you're not catching me today. There are some people who are preoccupied on serving in the church. I'm an elder. I'm deacon so-and-so. Don't you know who I am? I sit on the finance team. Help us. <laughs> and they see that if you still miss that relationship with God, this means nothing. You know what will be sad? You know what will be sad? Honestly, you know what will be sad? Individuals who wish that they could make it to heaven, who are doing all this stuff, wishing that that will get them into heaven, only to have the Savior come back and say, I don't know you. But I served on the church board. My church. But I'm a deacon. For whom did you serve? But I, I went and I, I got all the food, and every, every time there was community services, I was lifting the boxes. And who did you serve? I visited them in prison. Don't you know me? 
You know, you know there were two resurrections, right? There were two resurrections. And, and, and so there were individuals who are going to get up, right? They're going to get up and they're going to think that it is Jesus. And it won't be. All right, let, me, let that marinate on you. We, we got to get into prophecy so we know what I'm talking about. Look, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for individuals who are ready to meet him. Individuals who are so sold out to him that, that things don't matter. What matters is that, is that personal relationship. How do you know? How do you know that you're not on sinking sand? How do you know? Let me answer that question just by telling you this. I went to the sand dunes. Out in, in Oregon, there's a sand dunes. And the sand dunes, I mean, it's like the desert. You, you're, you're there, you know, and all of a sudden, all you see is sand for miles. And, and I've been there a couple of times, went there with a group of guys. And while we were walking, while we were walking, I realized that um, one of the guys yelled out, he's like, stay back. And I was like, what, what do you mean we're staying back? And so we, he's like, no, stay back. Um, and he just saw his foot, then his knees, and then his, his ties. And we're like, we can't leave you there. So we now did what we need to do. We formed a little line, reached out, and pulled him out. You all know what happened. In that moment, in the dunes, there are certain areas that looks a little darker than usual, and you know that it's sinking sand. It's, it, it's sinking sand. And he started sinking and, and, and I realized that when you're in sinking sand, it's hard to get out. And we started pulling with all our might, grown men pulling with all our might to get one of our friends out of the sand. And what I've come to tell you is that there are times when the enemy tries to catch us and unaware and we're in sinking sand and we don't even know it. And, and, and it, takes, it takes an entire body to actually help you because if no one is there to help you, you're going to die. And sinking sand is something so strange. Quicksand will catch you. And the enemy is trying to lure us in to quicksand. And this gentleman who is building and thinks that he's doing everything right doesn't realize that he's building on quicksand. That when the rains came and all the floods came and the wind came, then all of a sudden he realized, my gosh, my house is in turmoil. Now let me, let me make this thing plain with an application right here. Do you understand for every Christian who is fickle that when the storms come, that's when the true revelation comes of your situation? For every Christian who's playing the games, you're building that so-called foundation. I'm strong. I'm on the prayer team. But you don't have that intimate, that personal relationship with Christ. You're on quicksand. And it doesn't get revealed until the storm comes. All right, you're not hearing me yet. When the storm comes, when you get laid off from that job, that's when the rubber meets the road to see, are you truly a Christian? You still ain't there with me yet. When your kid gets expelled from school and you've invested all into that child and that child comes home and says, I don't feel like I want to do this anymore. That's when... The reality hits you that, am I, am I really a true Christian? And what is the security that we have? What is the security that we have? The Bible says the only security that we have is to build on a solid foundation, which is the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Do you know that's the only surety that we have? That we've got to build on the rock? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close, I'm going to close, but let me close with this, this story. There was a young man who, they lived close to the river, and ever so often when the, when, the, when the river would overflow, and there are some individuals, some cars and whatever else would get swept by the river, never to be seen again. Sometimes they find them way downstream. Anyone ever live by a river? Yeah. We live by a river. Yeah. And, and this young man, he went close to the river. That day, it was, it was a storm, one of those, 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 all of a sudden, it just comes out of nowhere, right? This type of storms. And he was there by the river, and, and before long, the wind was blowing. He got a little bit close, and he fell in. He fell in. 
And when he fell in, he was, he was sure he was going to die. He tried everything possible to beat his hands, to stay afloat, and he realized that, look, it's not working. And more he tried is the more that he was sinking. So he remembered, his mom said, look, if you just lay back and relax, you're going to stay afloat. He tried that, but he was still getting swept. So the next best thing, while he was going, he was, he was being hit by all types of debris. And he had an idea. Since I'm being swept down this river and I can't save myself, he just held on to the next best thing he could. And it ended up being a rock that was close to the edge. All right, I hope you're with me. There was a rock that was close to the edge. And even though the storms came and, and the wind was blowing and, and, the, and the rain was pouring down and the water was going faster and faster, all that he had in his mind is that if I just clench my hands to this rock and don't let go, I'm going to be saved. And I've come by to tell somebody today that they found that young man. He, when they found him, he was scared, he was wet, he was soaked. But guess what saved him? The fact that he was still clinched onto that rock. He would not let it go no matter what befell him, no matter what came at him, no matter the storm, no matter the rain, no matter what. The weather, when the winds blew, he still held onto that rock. And I've come by to tell somebody very simply today that in spite of what you're going through right now, because when the storms come, there is, there is something that clicks. Maybe I should just give up. Maybe I should just give in. Maybe I should just throw in the towel. I've been doing this for a long time. I should, I should just give up at this point. But I've come by to tell you that if you just hold on to the rock, that there is still hope. Amen. That in spite of what you're going through right now, hold on to the rock with your dear life. There's a crisis in this country. Many individuals have given up hope. Let's face it, when you look around many churches, individuals have given up hope. They've said, man, I don't know if this thing is working. If I can trust God, I've given up hope. I just can't keep coming back to church anymore. I mean, there's better things to do. God is not helping me. But I came by to tell you that if you just hold on to the rock, hold on to the rock, Christ Jesus, that there is still hope. Even when it feels like it's hopeless, even when it feels like you've just given all your energy and there is no hope in sight, just hold on a little while longer. Be sure God will take care of you. He always, he always takes care of us. He always comes through for us. Just hold on a little while longer. There are some who come into this country and you say, man, I don't see how immigration is going to work out for me. You're gone and you're giving money to lawyer after lawyer and still can't get a break. There are individuals who are looking for jobs and one job after the next you go through, you're overqualified. You're underqualified. This and that. Oh, we, we, and you're trying every connection you got. Everything you know. You're going to school, you're getting the skills, and you still can't get a break. But I've just come by to tell you, hold on a little while longer. Because God is on the case. For those who are, might be even failing school, failing a class right now that you know you need. And you need to get, to get this one step ahead. But every time you take that one step ahead, it's like two steps back. And you're trying desperately to go on. And it seems like you're in quicksand. But guess what? If you just hold on. That's why the church is here. I gave you that illustration a little while ago about my friends. And I'm telling you that if that's why the church exists. Because once you are around individuals who can hold you up, who can pull you back, who can hold you accountable, who can make the changes that's necessary to help you along the way, you know that's what the church exists for. When you don't have a church family and you're just trying to do it all by yourself, Mr. Do it DIY, Mrs. DIY, and you realize I can't do this all by myself. I need backup. I need somebody who can pray for me when I just can't even pray. Have you ever been in a situation where you just feel like I can't pray? I'm, 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 it may not resonate with everyone here right now, but there are some of us who have been in situations where we feel like we're so pressed that we can't pray. And I've come by to tell you that in those moments, still trust God. Still hold on to him in spite of all the craziness that's going along. Because guess what? If you're going through a tumultuous time right now, could it be that the enemy hates your guts? Because you're a threat? Could it be? Because the devil won't attack people who's helping him out and doing absolutely nothing. But if he knows that you're, you're earnestly, you're going to God, you're praying, you're petitioning, you're begging, and he's like, oh yeah? That's the one. Look at what he did to Job. 
Look at what he did to Job. And many of us are in pain. We come in here barely. We get in here after 12 when the announcements are done. Come on, I'm talking to you. And, and we see, man, all these things keep coming at us. In the week, you are hard-pressed. Let's face it. I'm speaking truth, am I not? In the week, we are hard-pressed. Some of us didn't even want to come to church today. We want to be at home in our cozy couches or bed and just surf. But God brought you here today because he knows that you need a change. And anything else is sinking sand. But you can build on a solid foundation right here. And when you come to God, when we come to God together as a church family, and we say, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what's going on in my life. All these things are just unraveling. Everything is chaotic. I don't have enough. I can't seem to make it. My money just, I'm just I just don't know what to do. My place is on the rocks right now. I don't even know if I'm going get, to get, get a letter that says I'm evicted. I don't know what I'm going to do, but that's why you come to church. Because in that moment, God hears your cry and he works a miracle in spite of all the things that we're hard-pressed against. We serve a mighty God. And all God asks is for us to just trust him. Trust that he knows that throughout the storm of our life that comes that we would not break. Do you know that when I look at this thing, it gives me hope because the, the wise man who built his house on a rock who was able to be there. When the winds came, he did not break. Why? Because, because he was anchored. Where was he anchored? In the rock. The rock is Jesus. That no matter what befalls him, he was not going to be swayed. No matter what came his way, he was not going to just give up. He was going to hold on for every fiber of his being. And I challenge you all this week, no matter what comes your way, no matter what befalls you, to be anchored in Christ. When you don't see it, be sure that God is working behind the scenes. Have you ever been in a situation where you question God? I mean, be honest with me. Have you ever been in a situation where you question God? Are you even there? I remember one day I, I, I was like, God, I don't understand what's going on. Listen, I'm, I'm in ministry, right? I'm in ministry. I've been visiting these folks, and I'm like, God, are you there? God, show up. And I walk outside, and I couldn't see a sign. I'm like, well, God, and you put God to those tests, right, those ridiculous, silly tests sometimes. Am I the only one? All right, you, you with me on that. And I'm like, God, if you are really God, then give me some money right now. Anyone ever did that? Show up, because you did it for so-and-so, you did it for so-and-so. I mean, really and truly, there are times I even testified to you guys that God, when I was doing stupid stuff, God still had money in the wind blowing to me. So I'm like, God, show up right now and show me that you are still there even when I'm, I'm in this situation. Show me that you still care. And I looked around and there was nothing. And I'm like, God, you're not there. Really? Really? You're going to leave me in this situation? You know when you're really hard-pressed, you ask God to do some crazy stuff? And I said, all right, God, I don't know. I opened my car door. I put my one foot in. One foot is on the ground. And when I moved my foot, there was something underneath. And it was a dollar. There was a dollar. Mitch, you laughing, but it's true, man. There was a dollar right underneath my foot stuck on some chewing gum. I peeled off the dollar, rolled it up, and I said, God, you have a sense of humor. <laughs> stuck the dollar in my wallet, and I kept that dollar there for years. And in those moments when I feel my lowest, when I feel like throwing in the towel, I would look at that rolled up, crumpled up dollar with a piece of chewing gum on it. Yes, I kept the piece of chewing gum. That reminds me that when you're at your lowest, God cares. When it seems like God is not there and it's like 
he's absent from the situation, God reminds me he's never absent. That when he seems distant is a moment when you feel alone, he's still there guiding. And I've experienced moments where I've walked in and I'm, and I'm like, God, I don't see how you can work through this situation. And every single time, God works it out. Every single time. So for those who are worried about your job, when you get that next interview and you walk in there, and it may even be a disappointment, and you come out and you have your head hang down low, and you lost out on this other job that you had, and you're feeling like, man, I don't understand what's happening. Just let God remind you that he cares for you. If he blocks it, there's a reason. If he stops you, there's a reason. And you've got to remember that you're not building on sand. You're anchored, and God knows what he's doing. This morning, this morning, on the way, I knew we had baptism. I'm on the Sabbath school panel, and I have to be here early enough to be on the Sabbath school panel because the superintendent, Brother Duke, is watching. And I'm like, man, all right, we get out of the house. We all get in the car. My daughter says she forgot something. We try to get back into the house, and we're locked out. For those who have those little keypads, just know you could be locked out. Always have something, some other door or window you can get into. We're locked out of our house, trying to get in. We're like, God, how? You know we need to be there. We're in the car. We can't leave like this. Now we're stuck. And for some, they may say, but God, why are you keeping me back? Why, why, why is it that, that, that this traffic is stopping us from getting faster? And my approach has changed like yours should. Because when God is delaying you, is because he's preventing you from something. And a delay is only that, a delay. It doesn't mean that he says no. And I had to say, man, what are you doing trying to hustle and push and all this stuff? Just relax. And I said, you know what? I turned to Blaney in the car. I was like, why am I trying to speed? I just eased my foot off the gas. I said, God is going to get us there because he knows exactly what he's doing. There's no reason. That crazy driver that comes before you this week, who you're like, they're going too slow. Beep, beep. Just know that God is leading and he's saving you from something. Appreciate the fact that God still cares for you. And he's putting that covering around you from doing something crazy. Appreciate the fact that God saved you from getting that job. Because if you got into that job, you would have a crazy boss who is a tyrant. So God has to block you from getting in that position. But all the while you're upset. God, why you didn't give me that job? You know my rent needs to be paid. But he's like, if you went in there, you'll drive yourself nuts. So God saves us. God always puts up the barriers for his children. He knows what he's doing. Just trust him. Be anchored in him. And know that he has your best interest at heart. For the next minute or so, I'm done. But I want to extend an invitation to those that just need to trust God today. Maybe you're not seeing it. Maybe you've been clouded. Maybe there's things happening in your life and you're like, God, I just need to trust you. If that is you, you're like me, I invite you to stand with me. We're going to pray together. You want to say, God, I just want to trust you. There's some things I don't understand. I just want to trust you. Things are not clear, but I just want to trust you. Amen, amen, amen. Today we also had a baptism. And Peggy, where are you, Peggy? Just come on up. Come on up, Peggy. She just gave her life to God today. We can put our hands together for her. We applaud your decision. And we know that God is with you. God is with those two little ones that he has entrusted you with. And I'm looking at all of these individuals. You see all of them here and those online. There are individuals who have yet to make their life the commitment to Jesus Christ. 
And if that is you today that God has brought here to make that commitment, I'm going to invite you to be like Peggy and say yes. Just say yes. We've been praying for you. We know that God's, God, God's Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. And God brought you here even when you didn't even feel like it. God brought you here. And now the responsibility is yours to say, God, now that I've heard the message on building on something that's secure, which is you, i got to make up my mind. And I'm asking you right now, if God has been speaking to you time and time again, saying, look, I need to make that commitment, and you want to make that commitment to him, whether it is, it is a recommitment, whether you're saying, you know what, I want to be rebaptized, I want to come back, I want to come back to the fold, I want to be able to serve him with everything I've got. If that is you, I'm inviting you to raise your hand. Raise your hand right now. To say, you know what, I want to commit to you, God. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for you today. You want to say, I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to him. I want to recommit my life to him. I want to serve him. If that is you today, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand. I want to pray over you. I want to raise your hand. Say, God, I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to be anchored in you. It's very simple. I'm going to be anchored in you. We can prepare. We can do Bible studies together. In preparation for the next baptism. You want to commit to Jesus Christ? You want to recommit to Jesus Christ? If that is you today, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand. I don't want to belabor it. Just raise your hand. I want to pray over you. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. last call. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to say yes today. If that is you, just raise your hand. Father, we want to thank you today that we can build on a solid foundation. We know that foundation is only you, O oh God. So we ask today that you will bless your people. You know exactly the ones that are online and those that are here who need to surrender their lives to you. So we ask today, oh God, that you will continue to speak to the hearts of every single person under the sound of my voice. That we'll be anchored, we'll be fastened, we'll be secure. That when the storms come, the time of the shaking comes, that we'll not be one of those who will be shaken out. So bless us, keep us, shield us, protect us and provide for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.